Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Covenant Cast, where we discuss the past, present, and future of tabletop gaming. I'm Zach. And I'm Steven, and we just can't stop talking internally about this casual, competitive, uh, you know, what what's the culture of your play space, your gaming environment, your club, your group of friends, and how that relates to any given individual's enjoyment of this hobby and how it can make or break it. Uh, so I've got some ideas. I've got some uh, things I want to bring to the table. I'm going to spring on Zach on this episode. I think he's got some things that uh, he wants to spring on me. And we're going to start and probably not finish uh, this discussion. So let's get into it. Stay tuned. Casual versus competitive. So these are words. Mm -hmm. Words are valuable because they have definitions. All right, we're out of here. Thank they you for listening. They convey meaning. <laughs> they convey meaning with a singular word. You can convey a lot of things. Yeah, the unfortunate uh, side effect of that is that uh, these words, I think, are largely seen as insufficient. Uh, and in fact, uh, con more confusing than helpful at this point when we talk about, well, when we talk about what we really mean. Um, and, and I think what, what we're talking about in tabletop gaming and in a lot of hobbies, I think that probably deal with this also is the degree to which somebody is motivated, uh, to take their hobby to a more serious level. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by serious is they get very interested in having positive results um, seeing themselves improve as it compares to some kind of objective standard um, and trying to inevitably, uh, for some, become a known uh, entity in whatever they're competing in. This person is good at this game and here's the championship to prove it or the tournament sure. results to prove it. And you, you, know, you mentioned at their hobby uh, and for some, it, it goes beyond that though. It's, it's not just a hobby in the same way that Playing basketball for most is a hobby or an activity. For some, it's a profession. Yeah. And there's different ways that comes about. And whether or not tabletop games should ever be a profession is a different topic for a different day. But there's a lot of reasons I think these words fail to convey the proper meaning and why I don't like using them. For example, when you say casual, sometimes that can be pretty dismissive to people that you might put in that category. Yeah. Uh, because it does not mean that they don't want to be good at the game, that they don't take the being good at that thing seriously. That they're not trying their best. Yeah, but it also might mean that they're not traveling every weekend to a major tournament. They're not practicing every morning. They're not uh, you know, trying to be the next world champion, but that doesn't mean they're not competitive or not serious about it. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're just very broad. I mean, anytime you try to generalize the way an entire group of people participates in something into two broad categories, probably not enough words mm -hmm. uh, to to speak. And uh, we've, we've gone around this horn a lot, but more and more it feels to me, one, one framing we were talking about recently was uh, serious and social, mm -hmm. which uh, is kind of okay. Has its own failings and kind of in the exact same ways, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah, and, and there's really, uh, to me, a scale. And a lot of it comes down to why you're doing this in the first place. Yeah, and let me let me frame this up as to why it matters, right? Mm -hmm. I, I think it's easy to feel like you get lost in the weeds on this kind of stuff. And it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. People are going to keep doing it the way they want to do it. Why does this matter? I think it's of particular importance to us and why it keeps coming up is that we're designing and thinking actively about this store that we're building. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and the culture inside of that store has everything to do with how people are going to feel and how readily they're going to want to come to it to engage in the hobby that they like. Yeah. And there are a lot of different people that engage in this hobby differently. And if you can find a way to bring them all together and to create happiness and uh, positive experiences for everybody, regardless of where they are on the spectrum we're trying to define, not only does our store do better, but the hobby itself mm -hmm. attracts more people and it keeps more people less frustrated and less likely to leave to go do something else. Yeah. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a thing that if, I mean, if perfectly solved, which of course is uh, not conceivable, Am ambitious. but if, if it were to be continuously solved more and more, it's only upside for everybody in. Um, 
more players coming in, more players that are likely to do things the way you want to do them, uh, and on it goes. So I think there is stakes here for sure. And even just as individuals who participate in the hobby, having a industry or you know as a hob as a community understanding of these words and how they're defined and when they're used, uh, I think is relevant. You hear all the time. Uh, it goes both directions. Like I wish there were more serious players around that I could play against so I could practice for, you know, when I go to world championship for fab or, or nationals or something, some people, are like, I just don't have access to, you know, serious players. Mm -hmm. uh, meanwhile, a lot of other people are saying uh, my local scene is only serious players. So I, I don't have a chance at winning. And mm -hmm. it's just like this whole thing. We, I think we have some commentary coming about that. But yeah. I can get right into that if you want. Yeah, sure. Let's do it. So this is a, a very good friend of mine I uh, met through this hobby on uh, Discord, in the Covenant Discord, so, and, and we were talking and kind of this this message came through. Met, met through Fab, I assume? Yeah. So I asked, how's it going on the Flesh and Blood side of life? So in case you don't know by now, Flesh and Blood is a trading card game. It's it's Flesh and Blood is also a specific kind of example here mm -hmm. because it does have a marketing skew and a culture skew towards we want to be the next competitive tournament driven pro tour card game so that it is likely to set the tone uh, to some degree and i would like to get into that uh, side of this as well but which we will here's what uh, was said uh basically how's it going for fab said well i haven't played at all recently actually uh, i've been working through marvel champions this weekend did some mini painting for the pandemic star wars game that just came out which if this sounds like you, you are in good company. <laughs> there's a Venn diagram and I'm, there's a lot of boxes being checked here. Yeah, I said, I might go to an armory this week. We'll see. The problem with fab in this area is that the players are all, all caps, hardcore. And that is a, a certain kind of word that I think is appropriate for some oh, player types. I've met those players. They're all on Talishar every night. That's the digital client for the game, the browser-based one where you can just jam game after mm -hmm. game after game. Basically a really easy way to get a lot of practice all at once. Uh, they all play in person multiple times per week. I'm lucky if I make it a couple times in a month. Uh, I haven't even touched Talishar, the digital client. Um, saying, I think Icelander's a really good hero. This is the deck that this person is working on. But I'm just totally outclassed from the other locals because they play all the time. I don't even think it'd matter if I switched to another hero. So I hope they release PvE sooner rather than later because that'll definitely give my interest back up in the game. Put a footnote on that for a second. Yep, penned. So I, I basically asked, well, um, you know, that's a fascinating problem. What do you think is a solution to the hardcore players? Uh, this person says, no idea. Uh, I think they're just going to be an insular group, I guess. It's not fun to play against them because they're 100% guaranteed to all beat me. One of them even complained I was too slow last time I played, which I don't think I was. They're all just super fast. Said, I don't think new players will stick around either. They're probably likely to be behind the curve and get discouraged. I told him literally, I can't play faster, but if it goes to time, like you can have the win. It's not important to me, basically. Uh, and it didn't go to time. And yeah, nothing was 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 actually a, a problem. Um, said, I probably played about 10 or 12 games against them, and the best I ever did was draw versus one of them, uh, not a single win. Uh, now, winning isn't everything, but you are playing for it. Notable. And if you have no chance, not even a glimmer of hope, it just kind of takes the wind out of your sails. I guess I look at it as the following. Talishar, again, the digital client, was the straw that broke the camel's back. I don't really have an interest in it, but everyone else around here embraced it, and they were all playing a lot anyways. So now it's like 10 times work because they're basically getting infinite reps at this game. Um, and that's effectively the frame yeah. for a lot of this. It's like this is a player who was and is still interested in engaging with a local community. And again, this comes back to we're thinking about our store. There are players that are going to be like this. And if they come in and it's hardcore players trying to win and getting infinite reps and they feel like they don't have a shot, they will just stop coming. Yeah. Uh, and that's what's happening here. And you see the uh, kind of the movement is, okay, well, minis painting, PVE, Marvel Champions, solo slash co-op. It's like, okay, like this starts to make sense as to where personas start to move, even if they might want to be involved in a different kind mm -hmm. of game. It feels like there's certain formats that are the only ones they can be involved in without having this problem of hardcore players eventually running the show. Sure. So 
to you, Zach, <laughs> as a very serious flesh and blood player. You play daily at this point. Yep. And uh, some would say get infinite reps compared to a uh, great many people who mm -hmm. do play the game. Um, how does that strike you? What do you think about that? Well, this this con comment, because uh, I, I know the person as well, uh, hit me. It stuck with me. You, you actually read this to me a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we were talking about what what you on the podcast, and you read this particular one to me, and it, it just sat with me. Um, and it, it, in some ways, it makes me sad. I, I think the comment about someone saying you're playing too slow, uh, knowing that the culture around uh, culture is really important. And I remember back in 2.0 store days with Destiny. I think me uh, and Eric Wainwright, another local that I uh, now play fab with. Um, we're both the most consistent people to show up that were also really good at the game. Um, but we were constantly doing things to uh, make the environment friendly for new people, both as a store and as a player community of Destiny players. Slow girl leagues, doing sealed and draft, playing, you know, decks that are experimental where we still have to try our hardest, but it, it kind of makes the game less intense for a new player. You know, there was a while there where if I was playing my Han Ray deck, for example, every league night, it would not have been fun for me or them. So you, you eventually, and it's a tough, it's a struggle because when I do get paired against Eric in the tournament, we both want, we would prefer to be playing our best decks against the, the best player and getting those experiences. But if you tone it down and it's just this whole, whole mess, but it, uh, I've, I've been playing, keep my foot on the other side of the the path, I guess, uh, through our Discord League on Tuesday nights. And I notably go into those uh, very, like with a very different intent. It's like I'm, I'm playing against someone from somewhere else. I may not know them. They could be from, they're all over the world at this point. Uh, but as I've played more fab over the past year, it's really about how long it's been serious or hardcore or whatever you want to mm -hmm. call it. Um, I can definitely a lot of times feel that gap getting created where you're having these moments of, well, if I if I do the right things, this is going to get degenerate really quickly, and then it's not really going to be a game. Um, so thinking through that, though, it's, it's a real uh, – I'm going to need to experience it at some point. But I think about Magic the Gathering, honestly. And they're the biggest game with the biggest community. And forever during the FFG zone of the 2010s, I guess, all those FFG games that were coming through that we were playing, I remember so many people saying, what this game needs is a big tournament series. Um, yeah. And now with Fab, we have a game that has the big tournament series. Yeah. So it, we're getting to experience a very different side of that coin, mm -hmm. but it's still a as successful as it is, um, I think comparatively still small. And is it, do you find any irony in the, now the fab core says we need a big casual scene? You know, like that, it's funny that you have the LCGs saying we need this big tournament circuit and then fab is a big tournament circuit and everyone's saying we need this casual support. Which it, it makes sense though, right? Because mm -hmm. if you don't have something, the, you're not going to hear people saying, and I mean, unless it's just going a bonkers good for one reason or another. No one's going to say we need more fab tournaments, right? You have fab tournaments all the time, so I that it makes sense. There's not that complaint. It would almost be like you know if you were a restaurant and you didn't have queso. It's like well we hear people saying they wish that we had queso. If we had queso, no one's going to be you know saying like, mm -hmm. we need more queso that kind of a thing. So basically, it's like what we need is strong support uh, in quotation marks for both. Well, and whatever that looks like, or or do we? Yeah, so, which is the the that that's kind of my question. It, you're going to hear from people who aren't being served. So in this case, a comment there, uh, Fab set out to be a tournament game. They are working on PvE, um, I'm, but a little dev devil's advocate. I think Magic, that's why I was mentioning Magic, they have all of it. Mm -hmm. They have the giant OP circuit, they brought the Pro Tour back, they have Friday Night Magic. I think people know where and how to engage with Magic in a way to get the experience they want. There's enough players. If you want to play at the kitchen table, you can probably do that. If you want to play Friday Night Magic casual, you can do that. If you want to play in a big tournament and with serious players, you can probably find that because there's just such a volume of people. Yeah, so there's then, enough people. Then you zoom in on something like Fab, and 
I do think it would be, uh, it's sort of like, uh, what was the other game? There's a lot of games doing this right now. So Fab talked about they're going to be adding a PvE, like a cooperative version of a game. Um, Ashes, Ashes, same clearly, thing. Yeah. Um, what's the game? Isn't there a game already doing it? Am I losing my mind? No, there probably is. I mean, I would be surprised if there wasn't. Yeah. But in my mind, the offering experiences for any particular interest in way and engaging in your game, if you can successfully do it, is better than not doing it. Yeah. But I also am not convinced, Look, like, like all the FFG games, they didn't have the resources or the bandwidth to do the, or the basic economic model <laughs> to yeah, do right. the million dollar fab pro tour circuit series. It just wasn't like it. Which we'll see also probably in Keyforge in the way that that all goes, right? Yeah. It's it's not going to be the same kind of premier mm -hmm. event series that you would expect for Magic Pro Tours or Fab Pro Tours. But at the same time, like, so, you know, granted, like um, certain people uh, want certain things out of uh, playing with the games that they've they've mm -hmm. purchased. Uh, but there is, I think, a tendency to say, well, like, um, for lack of a better word, we'll just keep using the terms casual players. <laughs> uh, if you're a casual player, then PvE is for you and don't touch the tournament scene and uh, don't come to the armory events and whatnot. And if you're a serious player, a competitive player, then yeah, you got a tournament circuit, a pro mm -hmm. circuit, you wouldn't care about PvE, surely, right? So... Is it the, just the case that somebody who's looking to have a competitive experience without all of the sweatiness involved is just, is there nowhere for that person to be in the current ecosystem? So, I mean, I think there's comparables for this, right? Talk about sports. I talked about basketball earlier. We always talk about rock climbing and golf. Um and there's there's a lot of, of nuance here, but essentially, I think the uh, one of the discussions on the Discord channel was essentially should Legend Story, who's the publisher of Fab, um, actively support in air quotes casual play? Mm -hmm. And my my first question is always, well, what does that mean? Yeah, because if you look at something like local armory kits, free kits that stores can get with things that players generally want. Like, you know, in air quotes, good prizes. Um, but my thesis is the moment you incentivize it, the sweatiness or the seriousness enters the, the fray. Like if, right. if there's something that is is actually worth 20 to $50 and or something people want that the winner gets, it may not be everybody, but it is going to take a different tone. Uh, and whether or not that's what you want to be happening locally, that's a a good question but the moment you do introduce that outside thing it's no longer just like you know you have a rock climbing gym mm -hmm. there's no incentive right you steven go rock we go rock climbing together right now i've like i've gone once a long time ago yeah you would be better at it than me presumably both from experience and <laughs> just physical build i'm gonna guess you're a better rock climber than me i hope i would have a little more experience <laughs> that, at least. that'd be fun at that's a, that should be a stream. Steven, does that go rock climbing? We can take the team. You should do the whole uh, culture event in our rock is. wall. That'd yeah, be fun. Yeah. yeah. It'd be really and fun. And then at some point we'll do basketball. And you got to kind of learn to trust each other, you know, but it's not like lame. Like like uh, those challenge courses can be sometimes. Like the ropes courses. Yeah. Or it's like, yeah, close your eyes. Well. Um, so I think that like there's some things to to lay down first before even answering the question in a certain kind of way because you were, I, I don't know the terms you were using earlier, but we were driving and you had some some fun terms. I do, those? yeah. I can I can introduce that for sure. So, at at the base of it here, what we're talking about is um, this is a hobby where there's a challenge involved, and I think a, a great many hobbies, maybe all hobbies, uh, introduce challenge in some kind of a way. Even if you're a miniatures painter, the challenge is painting the minis. Mm -hmm. Like, can you keep it in the lines? Can you achieve your vision? <laughs> these kinds of things. Um, like you said, a casual basketball player, the challenge is getting the ball in the hoop, beating the other team, these kinds of things. Um, but there's distinctly different kinds of challenges, and tabletop is a very different kind of challenge in this way. If you and I go rock climbing, we have what I'm defining as like a fixed challenge, mm. right? The wall is the same for all of us. You're almost competing against yourself, if anything. You're competing against yourself, and if the section of the wall that I want to do is harder than what you want to do, then I climb the hard part, come down, and then we go climb 
the easier part. Mm -hmm. And we both get a challenge that is appropriate to our level of expertise and our desire. And we can get better at the same time while not being at the same level. Um, or we can continually come once every month and I climb my five sevens, you climb your five sixes. The routes are different every time or they're the same challenge, uh, same challenge level. And we could do that for the rest of our, our lives. Mm -hmm. We could go get breakfast, have some coffee, go climb at the gym for an hour and a half. And we can do that literally for the next 30 years and not actually get better. So that's not even a part, that's not even a necessary part of the comparison. So that's a fixed challenge. But the interesting thing is what happens whenever the challenge that one person has is directly tied to the level of skill that the other person has. Sure. Right? So like if suddenly the rock wall, if you and I went together, I would be climbing what you were, what your skill level was, and you would be climbing what my skill level was. I would be on the easy stuff and I would it would be way too easy. It wouldn't even be interesting to me. Mm -hmm. You would be on the hard stuff and you'd get three holds up and wouldn't be able to do anything. Yeah. And that, we wouldn't want to do that anymore. Mm -hmm. Nobody would want, you and I would not have coffee every morning. We wouldn't go get breakfast yeah. and go to the wall and hate it and then go home. So anytime you have a hobby where the challenge is what I'd call variable based on your opponent, this is going to come up because opponents are naturally going to be at higher skill levels or lower skill levels. Yeah. And trying to find that person who's at the perfect skill level for you and then to stay there with them is so difficult yeah it's rare yeah and, and it, there's one finding the person that's at that level or people yeah yeah or people two is some people will stay there forever and some people won't so even if you find the person they may not be there forever it's like a moment on their journey yeah. moving past you basically. and you know that's there are interesting concepts like ladder leagues or whatever but i think about the rock climbing example and it's like all right well let's say we're hanging out rock climbing that's fine enough or golfing or whatever. Golfing's the same. I, yeah, I yeah, yeah. the, the holes same. are not different based yep. on who you're going with, <clears throat> mm -hmm. right? And there's formats, like we did the scramble where like you're on a team. So you mm -hmm. always hit from whoever had the best shot. Um, and, you know, it's less often, but sometimes my shot gets used because I just have the mm -hmm. best shot and that feels great. And you know, that's, a team. Eff that's effectively PVE in yeah. a nutshell. Um, <clears throat> but if we were going rock climbing every Saturday and all of a sudden they were like, all right, Whoever finishes the course the fastest gets $50. Mm -hmm. Maybe neither of us care about $50, but let's say we both really care about the $50. <laughs> yeah. Um, it, the tone is very different. Yeah. Uh, immediately. It, it is a, a different kind of hobby, but even without it, uh, like in tabletop as an example, we, we saw this all the time. I've seen it so many times where without major incentives, weekly league night for a game over and over and over again, even without the intent, there will be players that get better. More skilled for one reason or another. Mm -hmm. uh, they're better at math, they're better at risk analysis, they're better at the basic concepts of the game, <laughs> better deck building, who yeah, knows what they're better, they better collections. The forums in their spare time, yep. these kinds of things. Yeah. But it just happens. Forums, so I just stated myself. The, the, the problem that I think, with the comment you read earlier, that is being addressed or pointed to the problem is something that is not new to my awareness because three years into any game, it's hard for a new player because they are coming in with a three-year skill gap. So unless there's a lot of new players all coming in at the same time, they walk in. I remember Josh Forbes back in the original store when he started playing Thrones. God He's, bless Josh Forbes. It, was, yeah. it may have gone six months before he won a single tournament game. Yeah. And let me tell you, what Josh Forbes is a unique person because <laughs> most people, like like that comment was saying, He's it's like, grit. yeah, it's like, I, it's not that I need to feel like I'm on equal footing but I need to win sometimes yeah otherwise like and you know maybe the wins for that person are actually more meaningful than the wins for the person that's used to winning mm -hmm. uh, but if it's not at least like a fifth of the time or a, an eighth of the time yeah then, yeah I get it eventually it's demotivating and you're you're just out mm -hmm. so just kind of running through the, the practicality of it I mean I think the other piece of this is three or four years into a game a lot of times the only people left are the people that really are into it and so how any publisher, not just Fab, addresses the natural problem that is created there, which is at some point, the new player growth is going to slow. New player growth covers all sins. Mm -hmm. There's a bunch of new players walking at the same time. They have other people, easy to find people at your skill level, at your experience level. You're fascinated by the game. There's so much to learn. It's exciting. You're the one new person. It's a problem. Or you're the one person that just fell behind. Um, and even in this case, talking about the 
hardcore players, there's, uh, I, I don't think there's anything that's going to change the mentality of the person leaving this comment. Like the goal is not let's build a bridge so they can eventually catch us. Cause I don't even think catching us is the goal. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, yeah. I don't it, aspire to be a hardcore player yeah, so and like, join you in this kind of like infinite rep yeah. mentality <laughs> that I would need to, to keep up. Yeah. Cause I think culturally, like you can have really good people that are friendly and welcoming and will help and educate and teach. Um, but if it, that's great for people that want to get there eventually, but for people that this is just a hobby and they just want to have a good time and good time for them might mean it is a skill I'm honing slowly, mm -hmm. but it might not mean that I'm ever like that gap is not going to close. Yeah. At any point ever. That's a real problem for a lot of games. Yeah. And, and I mean, and that's worth noting that card games in particular, and, and I, this is true for all tabletop and board games. I mean, it's true for the whole thing. Yeah. They're filled with very interesting puzzles to try to solve. And I think there's a general uh, desire for most people in this hobby uh, to engage with those puzzles and solve them to the best of their ability and see what happens as a result of their uh, proposed solution, right? It's so, like, it could be a fab turn. Oh, well, how does this turn out? You know, Ooh, I wonder if this will, uh, you know, win me the game or lose me the game. It could be taking the gold rather than the silver in a board game. And it's like, oh, my strategy this time, I'm gonna try to get yeah. all the gold and build this like building. I want to see how that's going to turn out. And that is a different vibe than you always take the silver because it's the best move. Right. Right. So it, there's a way to play these games um, that is engaging with the puzzle of them and the mental challenge of the game, but not feeling like you want to be able to perfectly solve the puzzle every time because the only way to do that is to practice, 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 hone, hone, hone. Um, and so where is that person? You know, like in the middle, you, you have, and these are like, it's two different, it's a different problem. It's two different approaches. You have the new player problem, which is they come in and some new players will aspire to be a hardcore player and onboarding them with a friendly, welcoming community is is a great thing to do. Mm -hmm. Welcoming, friendly, hardcore players exist, absolutely. Yeah. Like telling uh, this person to play faster and these kinds of things. That's kind of a separate problem from being yeah. good at flesh. That's, that's not good culture. Right. That's just yeah, like, you I'm should, just, that's just not good manners. Not that's not thinking I mean, about yeah. this. <laughs> this is a person who Which, we should be playing with. I, I understand where it comes from. If you're used to playing hardcore mm -hmm. and you're trying to get reps in for the big event this weekend and it's like you're playing against someone in a tournament and like, oh man, it's going to take 45 minutes. This could be a 20 minute game. I could get two games in. Yeah. Uh, but that, to me, that person's jumped the shark. Sure. It's like, well, if you're not enjoying being here, per per, that's my perspective, my my personal. But it's okay if that's how you want to engage in in this hobby. It's just a different vibe. And yeah. Good. But it is there. I mm -hmm. mean, you can engage that way, and I think there's not been a lot of controls on whether or not stores want that as their culture, which is something I also want to talk about. But so you do you do have a, a presumably very strong player base. I think like Commander as Magic's uh, premier kind of casual, if not premier format in general, and kind of that there's that professor uh, like YouTube <laughs> professor school of Magic player um, that is that like he's an avatar of I'm not going to go win the pro tour. Like you're not listening yeah. to that content or following that content. Like you might follow learning more about like channel fireball and these kinds of things. We've had to learn more about the history of magic and everything that's gone on there just to stay aware of how flesh and blood is doing certain things and inspired by certain things. Um, you know, but there's the channel fireball, uh, presentations of this is the best deck to win the tournament. And there's the pro professor presentation of like, here's this, uh, game of four people playing commander who one of them is, uh, you know, a celebrity and one of them's been my longtime friend and one of them I've never met before. And the, yeah. I don't know what this deck does. And here's some crazy commander decks and here's the weird things they're going to do. And it is important to note on commander, the format itself forces the social angle mm -hmm. or the lack of seriousness. You can still take it seriously. Don't get me wrong. People oh, do. I'm sure it has been taken seriously. Yeah. But from my experience with Game of Thrones LCG, anytime you have four players, it's immediately a social experiment mm -hmm. like that. You're you're already in a certain uh, uh, just crazy spot. I mean, mm -hmm. I have a lot to say about and that. It isn't format. all roses. I can yeah. tell you that. Yeah. Uh, the second thing is it's still the same rule set as magic. It's, you know, you have to really interact with multiple people. So it's a little different, but lands, creatures, attacks, still trying to be the you know last person with health left, that kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. um, but from a deck building perspective too, it's one copy of every card when the normal is four, I think. 
Yeah, I think I think that's, that's right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I may get that wrong. Yikes, <laughs> get torched. Anyways, the reason I say that though is the randomness that's introduced to decks because you literally have a I think it's a hundred card decks with one oh yeah of any given card yeah so from a seriousness standpoint I feel like that mitigates a lot of we're adding variability it, multiple people and variability is suddenly just a it's, a it's a different game yeah so you you might make the argument that the less you can actively control the outcome of a game the less serious or competitive that game can be I, I think inherently yeah. it has to be the case. So both multiplayer and that kind of deck building restriction totally changes the math on the control you have. Yeah, you just think about like <clears throat> how serious you can be about Yahtzee versus how serious you can be about Go or chess, yep. right? It's like I'm in full control. And when you feel like you're in full control, that also you're more personally invested in the outcome because this is a reflection of you, not a reflection yeah. of the randomness uh, of the game. I have, I have a niece who loves to play Yahtzee. Mm. And as a game, I'm not a huge fan of Yahtzee. <laughs> But like I can have fun playing Yahtzee with a family. It's like I'm just rolling dice, and it's like ah, oh, yeah. like okay. and mm-hmm. you, can, you can you know be funny about the commentary. Like, ah, I'm gonna roll like and like you can't control it. You're just rolling dice. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yes, yeah, so you have the variability. So that's that's where like when you talk about events or formats for something like Fab, to me, if you actually want something for people that aren't taking it super seriously, um, if that's even the goal. And that's, mm-hmm. that's where I'm, I, I don't know, is that the goal? They said they're doing PVE, so I assume they're at least wanting some amount of people to go play the game in a non-hardcore way. But I think that's important to the format. And you have a format in Magic Commander, and it's kind of chicken and egg, right? That's why I said, not even just what does Fab want, but realistically, I, I hate hearing comments like that. Like, it hurts to hear yeah. someone not being able to be involved, because I want everyone to be able to take part in the Mm -hmm. community, like ideally. Yeah, so um, let's talk about what that looks like, right? Like like some possible strategies for that. Mm -hmm. So first of all, is it possible? Is this the inevitability of humanness rather than anything a particular game or hobby or publisher has control of? Because I think all too often the solution is if you don't want to play Fab this way, go play Yahtzee. Right, and and that's not true. Like that's also not correct. Um, but also, games like Flesh and Blood and Magic have you have a significant amount of control over the outcome of the game per individual basis. So, if we talk about Commoner, that's still there. Yeah, we have not removed that. If we talk that, about Clash, that's still there. That's the problem with Commoner and Blitz and Clash. It's you, all the same. You lower the ceiling. Or the floor, you lower like what's required to get in. The budget is easier, yeah. Yeah, um, and the games are, it's less easy to create disproportionate advantage without access to some of those cards. So it feels closer, maybe. Mm-hmm. Um, but ultimately that's where I compare it to something like Commander. And like from the outset, Commander's format and structure forces it to be different. Yeah. And I think you could be really good at Commander, but if three other people at the table don't want you to win, you're not winning. Yeah, sure. Like I don't care how good your Commander deck is. And that's something you can adjust. It's kind of like when you're playing basketball. Let's say we're doing two on two. Growing up, it happened all the time. I was the third oldest brother. We'd play sports and we'd always pair off in the most equal way possible. So a lot of times it'd be me and my oldest brother versus my brother who's in the middle and a cousin who's also his age. Yeah. So it's like we have the tallest person and the shortest person and they have the two people in the middle. Yeah, and like we yeah. can have fun doing this thing, right? Um, so like in Commander, it's very, if someone's ahead because four player structure, three people can tag team. Yeah. And and you will sometimes squeak out the win because they were, we were all so focused on this other person. And I mean, I may be the worst player at the table, but I think the worst player at the table will win more often in Commander than in Standard Magic by oh, a sure. lot. Sure, By like yeah. d- a crazy amount. So right. the, to answer your question, is it possible? Um, I think the problem is the, how many people actually want to be in that category? Because ultimately with that comment, the I think the, the biggest step is how do we make it easy for that person to find other people who want the same thing mm-hmm. and are at a similar skill level? And Swiss of a tournament does that to an extent. If you're 0-3, you're going to play someone else at 0-3. So you're, at some point in a tournament, you probably run into someone who's at a similar vibe, similar level. Um, but... <clears throat> The one of the issues here is the thing about Fab right now, and at that specific local scene, if all the players are playing a certain way, 
It could be that 15 people were run off because they're not those people. It could also be that there's only one or two people who even want to engage in Mm -hmm. this manner in that community, in that area, in that way. Mm -hmm. And that's where that's where my actual questions of should they even like, do you even actually care about this? Yeah, Uh, because I don't I don't know what that number is. Yeah, and it could be that none of them go to the local store at all. I mean, there there could be hundreds around mm-hmm. you and you would have no idea. And I, I assume based on every story I've, I've received, every like uh, there's a lot of things that support this uh, assumption. Thesis. Assumption. This isn't a thesis. It's more of an You're assumption. You're not ready to formalize um, it yet. Well, I, I, my assumption is that the vast majority of magic even that happens is either at Friday Night Magic, which has an inherently uh, laid back vibe as far as I know. So why? Why does it have a laid back vibe? How, how is it able to do that? Uh, as far as I understand, it is heavily focused on limited and or not tournaments. It's Friday night. You can't have a 12 round tournament with a cut to top eight on a Friday night. And the vibe and the culture that's been set from wizards down to stores. I don't know if there are, I think there are promos, but I think the promos are participation or random Something like that. Um, a, that. That would be a good case study, I guess. Yeah, that's why I said assumption. We haven't actually looked at that. So there's Friday Night Magic. I'm I'm considering dabbling in magic when Lord of the Rings comes out, Lord of the Rings Magic set. Mm, here we go. Just so I can have the experience of what is it actually like to participate in the magic community and who plays this game and when do they play it and how do they play it? Because I am ignorant on it. <clears throat> that, is an, that is something I would, I would like to understand better. But... I think the other, and it, this may be more, I would love to know the stats. Really, there's three. The second one is the kitchen table. Mm-hmm. I think the number of people that I've interacted with that still own magic decks and have magic cards and occasionally go like play drafts or buy a box and draft at home with the same you know, group of four or eight, eight players is very high. Even the number of people playing commander not at a store is high. The third category actually is <laughs> I, I, the most magic probably happens on the apps. Yes. <laughs> the online yeah. platform, yeah. whether casual or competitive. And the apps have a really nice uh, benefit in that it's universal. It's players from all over the world. And it's really easy to have categories of what kind of game are you looking for? Like, yeah, so what But what would those categories be? Well, I know they do like the winner of this tournament this Saturday on the app wins $2,000. Mm-hmm. And it's X number of rounds. Anyone at X and two after so many rounds gets to stick around for the cut or whatever and there'll be randomly 500 people playing in a magic thing on the app on a saturday yeah um i i would assume and i don't know again ignorance um but i would guess that there's some sort of system in terms of like uh like the warhammer champions app back in the day Mm -hmm. where it's pairing you against someone at your tier yeah a random person within you know a standard deviation of where you're at as a player and the app can learn that it can it can look at your history of wins and all this kind of stuff and it can s- smartly pair you which is two things one it has the data but two it has the the size the community where a local scene in columbus ohio might only have 18 fab players and so if there were a bell curve on seriousness it, it may be the bulk in the middle are the serious players and you have a couple people that are new and a couple people that are just chilling and like playing a, a game and like mm-hmm. this is their one night a week they play for two hours and they don't think about their cards between right now and next time um compared to something like Keyforge, where we've seen a lot of people saying i only engage in this in local sealed like, yeah yeah i don't there's no deck building that's part of why i like it i just show up and i play play my three or four rounds at some point i'm going to be play, paired against people at a similar record as me and we're off to the off to the races. Yeah. I, w- I want to focus on that. Just hang out and chill and play a game group. Whatever this group is, is probably more what I am as well. How does this group get supported in the current tabletop gaming ecosystem? And is it possible to support them more? Or again, my maybe my more pessimistic <laughs> side says, hey, you know, this this is a problem that people have to solve for themselves. This is not a publisher problem, sometimes not even a store problem. This is the fact that, um, you know, if I want to find a climbing partner, I need to find the right climbing partner. Yeah. Like there's not a lot of help I can get from, uh, you know, mountain hardware in doing that. (laughs) So 
the the play and chill group this this is this is the group for me okay. um why are they what are their motivations and can't how do they find other people who are similarly motivated who are not just working their way up to hardcore yeah I, there's that's a very nuanced question <laughs> um very difficult question so I, you know i i think the the motivation <laughs> is tabletop games with people in person around a table are exceptionally fun and meaningful and powerful. I mean, it's the the basis for our entire existence here as a company is that we're, we are betting every day on the fact that it is something special and it is meaningful and people want that. Yeah, That's why the comment hurts because it's like, I don't want someone to miss out on that because there's nowhere for them to be, right? right? But I, I do think oftentimes there's way too much onus put on a publisher and I mean, man, I can't believe I'm saying this. And on a store <laughs> um, to, and I do think culture and environment have a lot to do with it. And I think stores have a lot more power in that than they realize. Yeah. But I, I'm still a, a huge believer in effectively the power of the player. I think the vast majority of local scenes, even for fab, don't exist without players being the, the force behind that. I know, I won't name any names, but I know mm -hmm. lots of stores where, Tournaments are run by players. Mm -hmm. The store is like letting them do it, but the store is not really in, uh, in you know, the proper store, uh, not involved. You know what's important about what you're <laughs> saying there? It, that, <laughs> Everything. That just makes me really uh, kind of crystallized around this idea. Is like, you know, it makes a ton of sense if you just zoom out and say like, well, what kind of players would spend all the time and energy that it takes to try to build a local scene that it's they can the do? It's the serious players, dude. the hardcore players Every time. do it. So, yeah. It's not terribly surprising that when you get that scene established, it's the hardcore players that you find there. Yeah, and when they find each other, it's like a it, there's a, a synergy there, right? It's like oh, like we're in this, we're doing this, and like we're showing up every Tuesday because we're serious about it. Yeah. And those two or three people showing up every Tuesday, eventually, Stephen walks by and says, "Hey, what are you guys doing?" He jumps in and like mm -hmm. on and on it goes, right? And it's like, do you want to be like good at like, it's yeah. like, let's get, let's refine each other. Versus if me, you, and a couple other people were hanging out at Chimera coffee shop downtown playing Soul Forge, just hanging out, we already know each other. It's mm -hmm. like, what, we aren't even thinking when someone walks by and it's like, what's this? Being like, oh, you want to sit down and learn? Like we need to indoctrinate you, right? It's like, yeah. we're hanging out with our friends doing a thing somewhere we like to do it. And a lot of times those people too, the other problem beyond what's their motivation or what's the what's the drive to do that? So many kitchen table players to me likely already have the people they play with. And we saw this all the time with Keyforge and Destiny, most notably before the pandemic, tons of people would drop in, buy a couple of Keyforge decks once a month. Mm -hmm. And you just start asking like, who, who are, are you? you? Like, who what, are yeah, you? Why, why, why don't you come in on Tuesdays? Like, oh, you know, like tournaments aren't for me, but me and a couple of buddies play at lunch. Mm. And like, that's it. Yeah. That, that's that's how they're experiencing it. So there's just, it's very hard. You know, that, that would be my next question is what what should a publisher or store even be doing to support? And like, given what I know about stores now, where the vast majority of stores aren't even really putting a lot of effort into games that are doing like, Fab has an OP system that you can plug into and do this thing. And st still yet, players are the ones running most of those yeah. interactions, let alone for the hangout and chill crowd yeah, who is coming into the store once every two months and not even asking or not making noise. It's just like... Just, yeah, hoping <clears throat> it's here. And yeah, I mean, the, it's really just, if you're looking to hang out and chill... I like it. we'll call it the the HCs cardboard hopefully, and chill. Hopefully it doesn't that doesn't actually uh, it doesn't have any weird context. HC I don't think stands for anything. Agency. Yeah. Um, the hangout and chill pairs like what we're talking about is if you're looking for that experience and you don't currently have people in your life that you can call up to have that. That's that's really what we're talking about. We're talking about people mm -hmm. who are looking for that. They go to a local store to try to find that, and they're met with all these hardcore players and a tournament scene full of incentives. Uh, and uh, basically the people spending all of the time at these venues are disproportionately likely to be hardcore into whatever it is that they're there to do. Especially as time goes on. Uh, yeah. Especially as time goes on. And so 
how i mean this is a huge problem <laughs> yeah this is a huge problem is if you were looking to engage in a game uh, with a game in this sliver then there's really no good way for you to meet people who are looking to do the same yeah and i think that's the maybe the the more fundamental question to be asking how how do we actually help those people find each other mm -hmm. and uh, Alex Becker on the Discord was posting about potentially doing a ladder league at his local space, which that's a cool way of doing it too. I don't know if you're familiar, mm -hmm. but <clears throat> you essentially have some kind of ranking system. And over time, you start ranking players. And then by default, when players show up, you're ranking in order of rank instead of just random. So that from the very beginning, players are likely to play people at the same skill level, yeah. whatever that looks like. And you know, and there it is worth separating this out too. We need to just draw a giant diagram or something because it's like a thousand terms that all kind of apply. Yeah, you can also have hardcore players that aren't very good. Totally. I mean, that, I know plenty of those. <laughs> I mean, we've been around that a lot too, and that can be more miserable. Oh yeah. Than a hardcore player that's actually good and wins and moves on. Yeah. I, I, in fact, the the good hard like people that are really good and they're that kind of person, are usually some of the best people yeah. in a community yeah. because they're nice and friendly and they educate in like a non-condescending uh, way. Mm -hmm. Eric Wainwright is a perfect example yeah. of this in our communities. Uh, he did so much good for our local Destiny community. Exceptionally smart, exceptionally good at the game. One of the nicest people you ever meet. Mm -hmm. And a new player sits across from round one and he's all about it. Like he loves the learning yeah. process. He loves teaching. Uh, and I know other people who shall remain nameless uh, <laughs> who aren't as nice and aren't as good. But are even more serious. And it is miserable sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. And we had to deal with some of that. And mm -hmm. culturally as a store, you know, we were sensitive to that. Had the tough conversations with some people. It's like, <laughs> can't do that. Yeah. Like you're just, you're not going to allow it. And, you know, we eventually got to the point uh, and I, I don't, it's not solved by any means, but prizes were random. Like our weekly mm -hmm. league nights, you, it was it was totally random. We were not doing, uh, you know, first place. Even if the the publisher sent us stuff that first place was supposed to get, it's like nope, play mat is going to be random. Yeah, because uh, otherwise, the same four really good players were getting all the play mats and all the promos and all the stuff, um, and it was really disincentivizing. But we were working at it, and even then, I don't know that it was right. Yeah, like that. That's the then incentives are necessarily the poison of, in the well mm -hmm. basically yeah. and you know for most stores most stores started out as retail stores and there are newer stores in a new wave where you know the focus on the space and the community is more prevalent but just thinking through the hangout and chill uh people like a lot of times they don't want to hang out in the store mm -hmm. and, and that's either the store isn't Store's not built to the chill right in. environment yeah. it's not it's not a chill in place right it's like a they're pl plastic tables fluorescent lights I'm going to grind some games and like, you know, get my thing, that kind mm -hmm. of experience. So that's where like, what's the incentive for the store to even accommodate the people that come in once every two or three months to buy something who play at home because they have a nice house and space and they have the two friends they want to invite over and they can make their own cocktails or they can make coffee or whatever they want to do in their, their own space. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know that it's uh, like, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to acknowledge, or I'm happy to say a couple things. I would love it if everyone could participate in the hobby in a way that they find enjoyable and meaningful. Because I do think uh, this is this is a hobby that has the ability to be meaningful and positive for everybody in yeah, the world. Hardcore I, on up and down. Yeah, one hundred percent. It could be a sport for you, all the way down to the hangout and chills to the I have an hour to kill and I'm mm -hmm. you know whatever waiting. To the on. Yahtzee players. <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, it, doesn't it doesn't matter, matter right? Um, I would love that to be the case, but I'm not prepared to say the onus is on the publisher and the retailer and even the players to accommodate that for every single game title, for every single type of player. And there's different genres of, of tabletop for this very reason. I do think it behooves publishers like Fab, if there's a cooperative version of the game that is immediately and and part of why that's powerful is just like when i go golfing with a couple of my friends i'm the worst one no question but a cooperative fab me and you could play with two people that are new and all have a good time mm. so i think it does behoove publishers of expandable games like this where there are competitive scenes to have experiences that are naturally 
uh, good for that. And Magic has Commander. I mean, there could be a fab format the same. And what that is in the context of what we were talking about earlier is that's taking a variable challenge game and turning it into a fixed challenge game. Yeah. Where there's a singular rock wall, there's a singular scenario, a singular experience that you're all fighting against. It doesn't change based on the skill level of people at the table, um, which is important. Yeah. That, that's available. Uh, but yeah, I think the starting with the assumption that the publisher and or the retailer should be solving the macro, like they should really be incentivizing and supporting this category. Uh, it, it's just being pragmatic about it. I, I don't know how big that category is or how relevant it is to them as a business, honestly. And in the long term, it, it may be short-sighted because it might mean the game isn't as successful as it could be, if not as friendly to new players, and eventually it fails, and maybe the store fails and all this stuff. And mm -hmm. that's a bigger question to be asking. Yeah, I do think if if we're going to put some onus, I mean, obviously, the there there is responsibility around in various places. Um, I think the store carries actually a lot of, they carry a lot of incentive to bring in as many different types of players as possible. Right. So like this, this is the old row with the retail space. But if they're wanting to sell more products, then having the same hardcore players buying the same amount of product every time is not growth. Yeah. And seeing new players come in and leave because uh, of the culture that you're setting in that space or because of the skill level of the players and the corresponding psychology uh, then those new players are no longer going to be buying products from you. Mm -hmm. If they ever were to begin with, I mean, this is the ultimate the problem of local retail is also they might just all go to Amazon and it doesn't matter if they play in your store or not. Yeah. But there, there is, I can definitely see that there would be an incentive if, if you want to sell more products. The hardcore players are hardcore players and they are taken care of. They've been taken care of throughout all of history. <laughs> you know, this is yeah. not, this is normal. They will find each other and they will they will make it happen. That's right. If I mean, we have seen, is there anything that isn't competitive anymore? If you want to go to the upper echelons of the most uncompetitive things, I'm sure there's competitive monopoly, right? I'm sure there's yeah. uh, comp competitive settlers of Catan, for goodness sakes. Yeah. This is not a competitive game, really, at its very heart, but here it is uh, being touted as one. Competitive eating, competitive hang gliding. I mean, yeah. choose anything. You, you, you will find the hardcore players looking to grind it out and create an identity around it. But if you're looking for growth then you have to actively get people in that are not currently there. And is there a big potential group of people who are looking to hang out and chill? I think the answer is yes. And honestly, I think there's a couple of things that have happened to speak to that problem. One of them are is formats like the unique deck format for Keyforge and uh, Soulforge Fusion. These are games that actively said, you know what, we can help uh, remove the agency that players have while still giving them enough agency to feel like they are playing a trading card game or a tabletop game in a productive way. So we're going to essentially randomize the decks, the unique decks. We're going to algorithmically make this thing happen. And that way, uh, one of the elements that a player has control of is a little bit more variable, a little bit more um, kind of un imperfected mm -hmm. or imperfect. So that when you have players of different skill types, at least the gap is a little less wide and they can have a fun experience more likely more sure. often together. That's one thing. So formats can play a difference just of the game and how you're releasing it and how you're uh, you know, releasing your yeah. deck building and rules and those kinds of things. One small caveat to formats, uh, which we saw in the Keyforge key announcement last week, the concern of formats is that if your community is small and you split it by having formats, it, you have different games going on and it, right. it, it, it's a, the problem. So right. that's what we're like with the current position in FAB. It's like, well, you could turn local armories into every month the format changes and it's going to be wild and you can't be practiced at it and it's going to be new deck building restrictions and craziness. But then those 12 people that are coming every week that are hardcore to that mm -hmm. one community may not show up to those. Right. And all of a sudden it's like, well, we did all this effort to, or half of them show up and half of them still are hardcore and like now you yeah. split and it just keeps you know, getting smaller. And, and your people looking to hang out and chill are just less tuned in to what you're saying. They may not even know those events exist. Yeah. So like... That all kind of spins around on itself. And then secondarily is, I think this is why things like board game cafes have started to make a big impact. They are, these are places that are actively saying- Built to chill. Built to chill, right? <laughs> so it's like, and what is one of the most chill things humans have done throughout history? Sit down, have some coffee or have a beer or have a meal mm -hmm. and 
usually you just chat around the table. Well, now you can do the gaming thing yeah. uh, in an environment that is associated with hanging out, being friends, chilling, yep. et cetera. Like we used to have our board game day on Sunday. There were 30 to 50 people every week yeah. hanging out and chilling yeah. and playing different games. And they, I mean, outside of us just saying, this is the day for it. Mm -hmm. And that's what's on the schedule. And we, you know, early kind of helping set, get those players in motion, they'd show up, pair off in ways that made sense to them and based on interests and how long they're gonna be around and stuff. And they kind of manage themselves. Mm -hmm. Now here's the here's the last thing that uh, I want to throw into the pot of, and again, this is kind of like I feel like this is a brainstorming session for like six episodes of where this is ultimately going to end up. Yeah, yeah, I have a comment I want to read too before we get out of here. Um, my my question here is like, in the case of Flesh and Blood, they they have the constructed format, classic constructed, ah, uh, classic, but Grr. there's not a non-classic constructed, so I don't really understand the. The title, although I suppose Blitz could be considered non-classic constructed. Yeah, it's something. We could have Nouveau constructed and then classic mm. constructed, maybe. Um, that's what class should be called, Nouveau constructed. <laughs> if I am a store owner uh -huh. and I am hosting events every week for Fab and uh -huh. I put it on my website and yada, yada, yada. If I put up an event that is, all caps, casual, constructed, flesh and blood, and then my description is no pressure, nobody take this super seriously. This is a casual hangout kind of party event. Um, would those kinds of events solve the problem? So would they change anything? Maybe. Just framing, you but know, like. They also may not, because in that example you had earlier, it could be 12 people show up, they just want to jam games because they're practicing for the big tournament coming up. And one person shows up and they're like, ah, I'm here to chill. Yeah. And they either no one plays against them. Yeah. That like so why tournaments, right? Why prizes? Why this whole structure? I think it's a very easily digestible, understandable system. I say tournament in tabletop. And if you've been around, you know what that means. <laughs> Probably gonna be Swiss. There's gonna be rounds. If you do well, there might be some you might get some packs or you might get some promos or whatever. There might be some random stuff going on easy like it's just easy to understand it's an easy structure by which everybody involved can play something together yeah yep. and swiss is nice because eventually you will play against people who are at your skill level mm -hmm. like with enough rounds you will eventually find that and you'll win and lose and win and lose if you could play 100 rounds you'd eventually just be playing the same people right yeah that are at that whatever how many people there are there anyways so that's where if you post the like hang out and play fab do not, not that you have to cater to the hardcore players, but like to the people that are really into it, maybe they show up, but does it really change their approach mm -hmm. to it at all? Um, and the people that are going to show up on a Tuesday night to a store to play fab? They're still going to play it hardcore. And that, who's going to show up to it, right? I mean, how can you change that? I mean, do you, do you work to do like, we're going to handicap you in this way if we know rick you're really good at the game so we're not gonna let you use any equipment today like yeah. these kinds of things but i mean keyforge kind of was doing it with <clears throat> the chains on the decks mm -hmm. um and you could chain players like maybe give them disadvantages the more they win or the higher rank they are or whatever um and i think there's crazy cool stuff you could do you could you could have it where it's like hey 12 players like build four decks each that are fun and thematic and like equally balanced against each other whatever <laughs> it is it's like, we're going to have a thing. It's like, hang out and play Fab Night. And when new players walk in or anyone that's interested in this experience, like we're going to hand them a stack of cards they can play. It's going to be a great time. Uh, let's just say you did that and a lot of new people Somehow, showed up. Yeah. yeah. That's the question. It's like, how, well, how many people even want, how many people are there actually that want to experience Fab at that level, but they're being kept out? Not just the example earlier, but like, I want to try Fab, but I'm not, I can't be super serious about it. Mm -hmm. And I'm... I think that they exist. I think the number of people, the moment you say cooperative PVE, huge category of people, love that experience, don't want the person to person aggression. You yeah, know, it's like challenge. It's like, hey, and teamwork. Like I, I will play with someone. I don't want to play against someone. Um, but when it's just casual, you know, in air quotes, casual fab, whatever that means, I'm, I do know there's people there. There's a lot of people there. I mean, I would say the majority of people 
that we're engaging with in even our Discord mm -hmm. are in this category. Yeah. The people I'm hanging out with uh, when we go to tournaments, uh, you know, when we go to like Vegas or something, and we're hanging out at the Sausage Factory, whatever that place is called. And Ever again. Yeah, playing some uh, little COVID breeding ground, uh, playing some fab. <laughs> I just, uh, yeah, I, I can't, it, schnitzel now makes me sick. <laughs> like the, the thought sick of schnitzel. Soul. Ugh, anyways. Um, but everyone I played that night, you know, all the way from Casey, David, and uh, all of these guys, like uh, Ugnoko, um, all the, it's just like. I like that you know that name and you didn't call him Matt. Yeah, I'm, I'm <laughs> going between screen names because David's got his in his thing. Yeah. Casey's in on the screen name Ugnoko. I don't Wade. know if they want their actual yeah. names. Yeah, Wade, of course. Um, it was, we were exactly on that level. It was yeah. that kind of game. Now, it was, everybody was playing well. Everybody knew the rules. Everybody was doing their best, building the best decks that they could. It was a limited environment, so that helped. Um, but there was a different atmosphere entirely, a different energy at the yeah. table. And to be fair, out of the thousands of people that were there at the event, we had 30 people that went to the German brew house afterwards. Culturally, they're going to be similar. Mm -hmm. Even just vibe-wise, I think you're already in pockets of willing to travel to Vegas and also want to go to the German brew house after. Right. Uh is a, is a pocket of players. Sure. Um, and honestly, like, that's some of the best times. Sure. That it's it's so good. And part of it, for me at least, that makes it the best is the, like, post-event hanging. And it's like, all right, like, we did the thing. We have the war experience to talk about. But now we're just chilling and having a beer and playing a game or whatever. Yeah. Um, but I guess my... But my point is those players clearly exist. They do I've exist. I've Yeah, them. but how many of them exist in any given local community? Yeah. And even if they do exist, do they do they already have people to play with? And is the local store an environment currently where they would want to do that? Because mm -hmm. we weren't in a local store. Yeah. We were in the back room at the whatever Hofbro, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, the Hofbro called. house, yeah. Um, which most stores don't feel that way. Mm -hmm. Like <laughs> it's a it's a different vibe. Yeah, you know, think about Quinn's hosting like Netrunner events in the and bottom the, of the pub yeah. and and these kinds of things. It's like maybe we're asking too much of the local, of the existing local retail environment, mm -hmm. which is benefiting from hardcore players buying lots of products, coming in every week to buy also other things, snacks, et cetera, whatever they're making their money on. Uh, and why are they looking to tip the apple cart on that system whenever it's clearly supporting a lot of stores in the country? Yeah, well, and the other half of that coin is I think a lot of stores are actually most benefited by this category, which is why it sounds appealing. Uh, because I think about magic and uh, 40k and pokemon and Yu-Gi-Oh, and like i know in magic they always say the com the competitive players don't almost ever buy product at all yeah like they win their stuff um and they buy singles but they're not buying boxes and they're not trying weird stuff they're just they need the five best cards from the set they don't need all this stuff um so there is this giant community and that may be part of the problem is there's already a game with a giant hangout and chill community mm -hmm. built in that it has 20 plus years of legacy of community and formats and you can go anywhere in the world probably and find people to play against on a Friday night to partake in this thing um, in this way. Like, yeah, it would be nice if every game had that. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not certain it's feasible though. Cause that's the, I mean, that's the other thing we've got to, it's this like swirling of almost contradictions like on the one hand saying Friday Night Magic is the lifeblood of that game and then saying I'm not sure there's enough players that want to do it this way. Well, I'm not sure there's enough fab players that want to do it sure. this way. Yeah, maybe. And, and the game might have a lot to do with it. Just simply how the game functions can mm -hmm. have a lot to do with and, that. And even how, like if you're, an, if you're a publisher of a new game, I feel like a lot of times the easiest people to get into your game are people that formally took a different game very seriously who are looking for a new game that's not the current thing that's out there. How many people that play Fab are former Magic players? Right. Who just and didn't probably like took Magic going. very seriously too. Uh, 100%. Right. I was like, oh, there's this new thing that's exciting for me to take seriously in a different mm -hmm. lane. Um, so I, I don't know. It's it's a That's why you said earlier even. It's more questions than answers. Yeah, we need the, answers from people listening. Because that's right. The, Come to the Discord uh, we're, channel. We're... We're very, we have a very specific perspective and we've, we've grown up a certain kind of way. We've yeah. had the experiences we've had in our little Tulsa, Oklahoma stores. Well, we grew up in a town without a store. 
Yeah. Playing in the back of a movie rental business that my uncle owned. And we happen to find each other very fortunately uh, we, engaging on the same way. We've always had people around who are engaged in the same way at the same seriousness. Yeah. Um, and I know that's not common. That's not always common. It's tough because the core problem is that people need to be able to find other people who are engaging at a similar level at a similar skill. There's not really a system that's doing that. And I'm not sure there's enough players to actually feasibly do that, mm -hmm. generally speaking. Yeah. And this is one of the only hobbies. There are many of them, but in the grand scheme of things you can do with your time, this is a unique problem to this subset of hobbies yeah. that rely on other people uh, to create the environment by which you do the thing. Because, yeah. you know, I was talking about uh, even road biking earlier. It's like, I can be in a road biking club with people who are trying to win the Tour de France and people who are trying to lose weight and bike five miles. And we can all get on the bike and do the same route. Yeah. And we don't need each other to be at the same skill level to enjoy the experience of doing that. Yeah. Which is where I think things like solo mode, co-op mode uh, are really relevant. And maybe, maybe it is less frequent uh, but socially intended gatherings. So maybe it's not the weekly armor event that pivots into the zany, crazy format, but the publisher could play a role in this, right? Which is some kind of quarterly kit There's uh, that has the stuff you need to run a 30-person hangout and play fab in like a fun way thing. Yeah, and Arkham kind of explored this, Lord of the Rings mm -hmm. explored this. Everybody and that comes gets a thing. Those are very successful. Yeah. Like, we always had 30 to 50 people at the, whatever those were called, I forget, uh, Fellowship Nights for yeah. Lord of the Rings and the, I don't know what the Arkham was called. This, not gonna, not gonna uh, just for context here, and then uh, we'll, we'll close with your comment here. Uh, here on Wizards, so what is Friday Night Magic, right? Mm -hmm. So, we're talking about culture, and we need to dive more into this, but um, what they're saying is, this is the heart and soul of your local magic community, open to all players and running in thousands of stores across the globe each Friday night. FNM is a chance to catch up with your friends, make new ones, and of course, play some magic. So even just the branding, the culture being set when you're reading that and saying, do I want to go to that? Yeah. They're making it very explicitly not about winning at magic. 100%. Now, are people going to go to Friday Night Magic and try to win at magic? I think there are going to be the same hardcore players who are going to be playing hardcore magic. Yes. But... Are there going to be enough other people that that's a minority or an ignorable slice that they can do their thing while everybody else kind of actually lives this make friends, hang out, also yeah. play some magic? And then you have to ask the question for a newer publisher, a newer game like Fab. They chose to enter the market and compete with something like Magic and, and they attacked the competitive slice. They built a game that are, I, I think is better built to be a competitive game. They all their marketing around this, you know, Magic was going online with a lot of their competitive stuff, removing the Pro Tour. Fab said, "Flesh and Blood, mm -hmm. we want to keep people coming together in Flesh and Blood all over the world." And here's this whole thing. Um, but even just logically thinking through, how does how would a publisher, because you're effectively competing with Friday Night Magic, if you're trying to take this right. hangout and chill right. segment, and asking, well, what would it take? And I. I don't know, you hear a lot of complaints about Magic and how they're handing collector's products and tournaments and programs and stuff. I have not really heard a lot of, man, Commander's really just horrible right now and Friday Night Magic right, isn't fun. Right, Because right. um, I don't think any of those things really matter. It's like, we're just getting together to play Magic on Fridays and I can do it anywhere in the world I'm at. I'm in Europe this week. Mm -hmm. well, let's fun go find a store on Friday. And like, it's really powerful. Yeah. Um, and that's where if I'm trying to get the perspective of something like Legend Story and Fab or Fantasy Flight with Key for or Ghost Galaxy with Key Forge. Um, where are you trying to? Like Key Forge to me is kind of attacking the, you want to play a card game. You don't want to be super competitive like Magic or have to do deck building. You don't want to do Fab competitive, but you also want to step up from like a Friday Night Magic. Sure. It's like you, you can kind of blend those experiences. It's somewhere on the pair, you know, the, the scale. Mm -hmm. Um but that is probably the, in terms of paper magic, the competitive advantage they have. That yeah, That is mass. just the mass of Casual people mass. casually playing the game is like unbelievable. Because what's crazy is like that casual play in this context requires more mass. 
Mm-hmm. And, you know, like casual players are less likely to consistently show up. Yep. They're less likely to be tuned into the events. So I can have two hardcore players and I know they're going to be there every single week. Yeah. Um, but I need 10 casual players to get four of them there at, at any given week. 100%. Because they've got families or they've got things to do or they're just not interested in that level. It's not their yeah. lifestyle, mm-hmm. right? Um, so that also creates a new conundrum. You do have to have a critical mass. And Friday Night Magic has seemingly achieved that through first to market, through scale, through establishing that over the past 30 years now. Yeah. So breaking into that is very difficult yeah, for that, a new publisher. You know, I think logically, if I were trying to break into that, it wouldn't be with, let's pick a different night and try to make this the casual night for this game. It would be cooperative version of the game or solo. Like yeah. Magic doesn't have, as far as I know, a solo mode. You can play yeah. in the app against like the computer or against other random people online. Um, but like solo and or cooperative, Magic has Commander, but they don't have narrative. They don't have us telling a story together. They don't have us participate. You know, being. A, I mean, you could have two v two and that kind of stuff. But I'm sure fans have created all sorts of stuff for that. But I'm not. Yeah, I don't think yeah. there's an official Wizards that, approach. That's where I would attack it. And yeah. they've already said they're doing it. Um, but all that to say, it, it is creating that is insanely tough. Yeah, it may not happen again. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, just strictly you don't have casual Yu-Gi-Oh night, right? Like, yeah. you, and Pokemon. I don't even. I don't know. The, I know well, nothing but, about yeah. Pokemon. Po- Zach. Pokemon has like uh, different leagues. Yeah, um, okay. and and league is a style of play that you can do a lot of fun stuff with in general, like uh, formats and skill levels and rankings and ladders and all whatever. Um, and but Pokemon skews young, right? I mean, it's eight to fourteen year olds is the bulk of people playing it, and so. Naturally, I think uh, like my niece was is is still into it, but she was more into it a couple of years ago. And like, there's a player turn that happens. Like, yeah, twelve year olds become yeah. fifteen or sixteen. They start driving. They start playing Pokemon less. And there, I I have some friends that play Fab. They went to a big Pokemon regional. They still have a big tournaments this mm-hmm. past weekend. I saw that. I was like, how does this even function? Like, this is <laughs> a crazy world. Um, but locally for Pokemon, I think they benefit from and Magic to a certain degree too. Uh, people move in and out by age a lot of the times. Yeah. And so it kind of keeps refreshing. So the skill gap is less. Plus Pokemon is a worldwide phenomenon. Like, right. Yeah. It's insane. It's this whole crazy thing. Yu-Gi-Oh is kind of the same, same deal. But if you're new as a publisher, a game trying to attack those things in the, like, it's, I, I don't even know. Mm-hmm. Like, especially when I feel like, I know there are people like the comment from the comment you read that are going to get left behind. And that's sad, but I'm, I know I, just from my uh, anecdotal experience with Keyforge and stuff locally, there's just those people that play at the kitchen table and that they don't need anything from you. Yeah. (laughs) Other than maybe to buy the product. But, you know, even if you had a really fun weekly gathering for people to play casually, that's just not even how they're wanting to experience it. It's mm-hmm. like I have my two or three friends and yeah, that's restrictive because someone else in that same category won't find those two or three people necessarily. Yeah. But I'm potentially not even looking to play Keyforge to meet new people. Like at a certain point in life, I have a lot of, like I'm fortunate, I have good friends and I'm not necessarily looking to add, and it happens all the time because of the games I play. It's like adding people to my <laughs> circle. It's like crazy. But the point of it being uh, letting, going back to the power of the player, letting people experience it the way they want. And if anything, publisher, retailer, to me, empowering players to be able to find each other and also create the experiences they want is probably the most sustainable solution instead of asking Legend Story to solve the the casual fab problem. Yeah, I mean, it's funny. I always think about how Blizzard released the map editor for Warcraft 2 uh, where players could make whatever they wanted mm-hmm. with the assets and, and language that they'd built in the game. And that allowed everybody to make and play whatever they wanted. Yeah. And it spun out into a thousand different formats rather than saying everybody needs to play Warcraft 2 this way. Yeah. Like, it, is that where Dota came from? Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. And so you know, many, all these just crazy so things. So many yeah. great games came from that. So I don't know what that looks like in physical yeah. tabletop, but I do want to end with this comment from Michael on our community texting uh, app. Just as a, a frame, uh, it was a different perspective. He's a coach. And okay, he, he had some uh, words to say. And this is, again, an ongoing conversation. If you listen to this and have thoughts, please go to our Discord go channel. Go to the Discord podcast discussion. I, w- I want to hear everything. Yeah. And I, I want to hear from all the players that do feel like they're being left out or left behind. Like, uh, is the volume actually there? Mm-hmm. Uh, it, have you experienced it? Do you know people that are 
do you have to, uh, all the, all the clearing, it's working for you how is it working what did the store do yeah. what did a publisher do what did you do yeah this is going to be an ongoing i feel like yeah. discussion. we need to solve it so we can have a successful store already. that's right yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, all right so michael says uh in uh, some coaching circles we use the terms leisure and performance to spit players by type both are competing on game day and both ultimately want to win. The difference is in their behavior at practice or when they're on their own and perhaps even their long-term goals. Performance players are driven at practice, intentional about personal tr things, perhaps things like nutrition, sleep, weight room, etc., And they're willing to work on their weaknesses. Uh, meanwhile, leisure players tend to take easier paths. They're less intentional at practice. And even during practice, they're often practicing things they've already mastered. That's really interesting to me. So like if you're a leisure player, this actually makes total sense. If you're really good at shooting threes, you go to practice and you just bang out threes for an hour because it feels awesome. Oh, yeah. But like the team doesn't need somebody who can only shoot threes. They need somebody who's good at defense and yep. can occasionally make a layup. But you don't care. It's like right now, practicing fab, my favorite form is constructed. And I, I'm pretty good at constructed. I, mm -hmm. My win rate at constructed is good. I know, like, I have decks that I'm good with. Even playing with heroes that I'm good with. That, and that's maybe most relevant. It's like, these are the heroes I love playing, and I'm going to play them even when maybe they're not the best. Yeah, which which is a feature of Fab. Yeah. Sometimes you you can, the, it's close enough of a gap. You can play <laughs> the heroes you love and get away with it sometimes. You just keep shooting the three with yeah, fire. Yeah, it's like, yeah. all right, here we go. Let's hit the threes, <laughs> baby. Um, but the World Championship's coming up, and... Constructed is five out of 16 rounds. Six rounds is limited and five rounds is blitz. So I'm over here practicing blitz and I, I'm going to be candid with everyone here on the podcast. Do not like blitz at all. I've never said that, but I've said that makes you a leisure player ultimately. Yeah. I mean, I mean, because I, mean, <laughs> like, I think there's a, a, a subset of players too that is like whatever it takes. Like I, it, I don't care if I like blitz yeah, or I, not. And like, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm one derivative off of that player. Yeah. Which like, is why we get along, really. Yeah, and even even the <laughs> in constructed, right? It's like I I took this right in the national championship, and it's wrong. I know it's yeah. wrong. I pro tour, I took Briar. I know it's wrong. <laughs> Do I have a chance to win? Yes, but I know it's wrong. Those are wrong decisions yeah. if, if the goal is strictly to win. But all yeah. that to say, um, I am taking it serious enough that I am getting the reps. I'm putting the time in on Blitz and Limited to give myself a shot at winning these things. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a scale. Like that's why categories also aren't. Uh, good enough because I think players all land not quite in the same spot, let yeah. alone skill level. There's a yeah. skill piece and then there's also a just where you're on the scale. It is good to think of leisure and performance as the two ends of the spectrum because I can imagine the full leisure player. Mm -hmm. I know that player. And I can imagine the full performance player also mm -hmm. know that player. Yeah. And, and there's scale in there uh, between. Uh, and the end of his comment was just that might inform your discussion on competitive versus casual. Well, play. it certainly has. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I which. Mean, it, Leisure is a good way to, to put it. And again, it's a scale to me mm -hmm. and less of a category because as we've just indicated with me, I, I, I am leaning performative, but not so far that I'm making choices over, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of a thing. There are heroes. If they were the, the heroes to play, I just wouldn't do it. Yeah. Like there's a 0% chance I'm ever, ever going to do it. Right. It, it, for whatever reason, like back I think when, that, that's true in Star Wars destiny too. Mm -hmm. Right, like if you got to run the Falcon Han endless loop combo to win a tournament, it's like I'd well, rather just not play. I wasn't doing it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, so that's where I land. And like even talking about you as a player, um, I think you're a derivative to the left towards mm -hmm, leisure. Definitely, yeah. Um, but you still you get joy out of taking specifically things that are considered bad mm -hmm. <laughs> and trying to make it work. Yeah. Right. On yeah. can you beat the someone that's completely performative on your mid, mid of the road leisure thing. Yeah, it's true. Is enjoyable for you. But for some people that would be, it would drive them crazy. Yeah. It's like, this is clearly bad and not good. And I don't <laughs> want to play against Starvo with this really bad thing. I'm out. Yeah. Like, I, I don't want to, I'm not even going to do it. Um, so, and it could be a, where it's like, there's an X, Y axis and one might be leisure to performative. Um, and there also might be some other variable going North to South. Yeah. And then it's it's really where does your dot land on the chart uh, compared to what category are you in? Mm -hmm. Which then makes it really hard to discuss because you can't say, let's do events for the leisure people. Um, that's not how that works. Yeah. Right. It, huh. A lot there. All right. Well, hey, thanks, uh, thanks for listening, everybody. This is still just top of mind. I, I think uh, this is the beginning of a, a journey of conversation. So we would really appreciate any input that folks have to offer. Go to the Discord podcast discussion channel is the best place for that. 
Um, and we would, would love to hear thoughts and even just continue the conversation there. Uh, hope to see you there. And until then, keep playing however you want. Mm-hmm.